Yeah, you know, most people go to church and, uh, and we might sing, we might not. At least as many people sing as don't, or at least as many people don't sing as do. Um, but if you really want to see worship, go to Michigan State or go to U of M or go to Ohio State or go to Penn State or go to a football game on a Saturday afternoon on a college campus and watch 105,000 people who all know the drill. It's liturgy. You walk in, you got music, you got a band, there's formations. You know, the people sit down, they stand up, they scream, they raise their hands, they do the wave, they do all these things, huh? They get it. They understand what's going on here, and they're there not to simply watch. They're there to throw themselves into it. And oftentimes, they act like absolute idiots in the process. You know, I'll paint my face blue and gold, or green and white, or scarlet and gray, and have no qualms about that. You know, and be on national TV, and do all these silly things that people do, holding up signs, and we're number one, and all that kind of stuff. Huh? They're involved in the game because they think it's worthwhile. And then we show up for the creator of the universe who has destroyed death, made it possible for me to live forever, washed away all my sins, given me a chance to start over, over and over and over and over again. And we're like, oh, yeah, you know, uh, okay. And, and we're not involved. But worship happens, unfortunately, in places where it shouldn't happen. Nothing wrong with going to a football game. But we shouldn't worship 11 men running around on the field. They don't do anything for you. They give you a momentary, fleeting feeling of diversion. Today, life is good. Michigan won, or Michigan State won, or whoever won. But every day, life is good, because my life's in God's hands, and He loves me, and He has a plan for me. And what could I possibly give back to God for all that God has given me? So if I, if I somehow can understand that it's worth throwing my, my voice and singing loud and being involved and, and being attentive to something as trivial as a game or a concert or whatever the case might be, I should be able to understand from that experience how much more God is deserving of everything. Yeah, how pathetic, right? You know, here, here, objectively speaking, it is all this and so much more. It's beyond description, huh? what's really happening there. If you and I could see what heaven looks like right now, we would be on our face. You know, if we could see the angels in adoration, we would just be shocked. But our experience of this is less than overwhelming. Why? The air might have gone out in church. Kids might be crying. The priest might have given a really pathetic sermon. The music might be bad. I'm filled with distractions from my daily life. I'm thinking about... Okay, mom and dad are coming over at four. We got to pick up the kids from the soccer game at three. I'm never going to have a chance to make dinner. Where are we going to get it? And boom, you've lost everything. You know, it's so easy to tune out. And because it's, because it has a ritualized structure to it, we know all the parts without thinking. And so we can just say the words, and yet my mind is on when am I going to get the kids or who's going to pick up dinner or. Oh, no, my Aunt Julie's coming over, and that's going to be awkward. I mean, whatever the case might be, you know? So we have to do everything we can, first of all, to learn. Like, I have to take some initiative. There is no excuse for anybody in this age, with all of the things that we have available to us online, to not know what's going on or to not understand something. But but I only make the effort to understand something that I think is worth it. The tragedy is we don't think that there's really anything worth getting out of Mass. Because there's no reason not to go look. It's all right there. There's thousands and thousands of books or talks that I can listen to or little things that I can read online or videos I can watch on YouTube or whatever the case might be. 
and I'll, I'll go watch something that I know will pay off for my life. But instead, many of us, we don't take the time to, to learn or to educate ourselves as to what's going on here. So I, f I have to take an initiative first. And then I have to do everything I can to tune out all distractions before I come to Mass. So like a, a good question to ask ourselves is, what am I doing on the way to church? You know, am I listening to the radio? Is that really what I should be doing? I don't, I don't know about you, but it takes me a while to actually begin to get quiet. So there's no way I can walk into something where somebody significant is going to speak to me and not be prepared. And if you're going in for an interview today, you would probably collect yourself before you sat down with the person, right? You know, if St. Augustine used to use this image, if, if you were in line and at the end of the line was the king and he was handing out jewels to people who could make some sort of uh, uh, convincing argument as to why they should receive some, you would be sitting there trying to come up with a good reason as to why you should receive some of these emeralds or rubies or diamonds, huh? You wouldn't just go, well, I hope I get the words when I get there. You would plan and prepare. We have to do the same thing when we come to Mass. I've got to tune out distractions. You know, there is little silence in most of our lives. We are distracted beyond measure. We've got smartphones and we're always in touch. And, and as a result of that, the mind is always doing this. And if it's always doing that, it's hard to hear. And God does not speak um, like a train whistle. God whispers, usually. And if I'm not accustomed to being used to silence and to listening for his voice, I'm not going to hear it. And if I don't hear it, then I'm going to miss what life's all about. So I have to make the effort to learn, and I've got to make the effort to be attentive when I come here. For example, the readings. Everybody in the world should know what readings are going to be said at Mass. It's not like, you know, I wake up that morning and go, uh, I think I'm going to do Hebrews 3. You know, we follow a lectionary, and all the readings are posted online for the whole world to see. You know, you ever gone to Mass and you hear the priest give a homily and you go, I think he just saw those readings for the first time right now. Because <laughs> what he said was just like that. So just like you would be upset with a priest who hadn't prayerfully prepared for Mass and to preach, so you should hold yourself to the same thing. You should read the readings throughout the week and be prepared for Sunday because because what we're reading in the newspapers and what we're reading on, uh, on our smartphones and what I'm seeing on TV is not in sync with what the Word of God says. So no wonder that the scriptures are proclaimed and we're like, whoa, you got to be kidding, love my enemies? Pray for those who persecute me? You're out of your mind. The world says, kill those who persecute you. So I have to make the reading of the Word of God a part of my daily life. And if you don't know what to read, we'll start reading the scriptures for the Sunday coming up so that, again, you're ready for them so that whether I say or whoever the priest or deacon or bishop preaches says something that gets you, the Lord, who's the only one we really need to hear from, will get you because you're familiar with His Word. You've been preparing for it all week. And now when you sit down in this assembly, which the Father has gathered together, you're ready to hear him speak. So it was very clear to me in my life at a certain point when I was uh, 25 or so that God was inviting me to serve him as a priest. That was abundantly clear. So I went to seminary. Um, as I'm going through seminary, I have great desires for lots of things as a priest, especially to preach and teach and, uh, and do a whole set of things that I felt like the Lord was really asking me to do. Um, the Mass was beyond boring to me. This is in the seminary. So I can remember probably uh, November of the year I was ordained. So I was ordained in May of 1996. 
somewhere around Thanksgiving, Christmas time of that year. I remember sitting in the chapel in the seminary, mindful that I'm now, I'm already a deacon, I'm six months from being a priest. And I said something as, as blunt as this. I just said, um, Lord, I don't really enjoy coming to Mass. And I'm going to be doing this at least once a day for the rest of my life. So you have to do something. So help. I don't get it. You know, I'm, I'm fine with going and all that, but it doesn't do much for me. So that January, it was my last semester in seminary, I had uh, among, among the classes that I had, I had a class taught by a guy named Father Jeremy Driscoll, who splits his time between Mount Angel Abbey in Oregon and Rome, which is where I was. And he taught a class on um, the relationship, sounds kind of technical, the relationship between fundamental theology and liturgy. What's that mean? It means um, a look at how God makes himself known in the Mass. And uh, the book, What Happens at Mass, is a shortened, condensed version of that class, which is as great a book as I know to give to anybody in the Mass. Well, I ran every day from his class to the chapel to go pray. Because it just opened my eyes. It was like, a, it was kind of like someone used the image once of going to the ocean every day and you're looking at the ocean and you're sitting on the beach and you're just kind of captivated by the roar of the waters and the majesty and the beauty and whatnot. And then someday somebody gives you a mask and you actually go into the ocean. And it hasn't taken away from anything, but now you're like, oh my gosh, I had no idea these things were in here. That's kind of how that class was to me. It's like God just dropped scales off my eyes and I got to see it and since then it's, it just continues to grow I hope anyway point being for all of us um, there's nothing wrong with going to God like a beggar and saying Lord I don't get this you have to do something but if I come to God with that kind of a desire if you come to God with that kind of a desire then you can bank on him doing something you know, we pray like beggars before him. Lord, I don't get this. That's how the saints prayed. I don't get it. We're sitting there saying all these little pious words that we think, please God, don't waste time. Tell him what's on your heart, he can read it anyway. I don't get it, I don't understand what happens at mass, I'm bored. Say it to him and then ask him for help. And then go do the work, you know, read something, listen to something, watch something, pray. You know, just say, Lord, help me understand what's happening right now. And he will. Might not come like that, but he will. Jesus says, if you who are wicked know how to give good gifts to your children, then how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to you? 